Thanks for tuning in to our seller interview series. Up today, we've got an Amazon FBA and e-commerce business for sale in the kitchenware niche. Created in October 2014, this business makes an average of $4,623 per month in net profit, and the listing number for the business is 46834. Now, we do these interviews to give potential buyers more information about both the seller and the asset they're looking to purchase. We hope these insights are helpful for you in making a buying decision. We've got the seller with us today to go through the business and cover everything from niche selection to traffic and monetization. Thanks for coming on, Hal. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Awesome. It's great to have you here. Before we get started, I'm going to go over a quick summary of the business. This business was built in October 2014. This business has monthly revenue of $23,282 and is producing an average net profit of $4,623, and that's based on an 11-month average. Included in the sale of the business are 439 SKUs, and that's Amazon, Shopify, deactivated SKUs, and design repository of 50,000 models and designs in various sizes, trademark, Shopify and Etsy storefronts, social media accounts, domain, and all site content files, manufacturing tools, SOPs, and influencer list. So now that we've gone through the details of the business, let's go ahead and get started with the interview. Can you tell me a little bit about your background in building and running online businesses? Sure. Yeah. So my background is in technology strategy and big data. It was before we built our first business about five years ago, which seems like a you know lifetime ago. But we tend to take a very data driven approach in finding opportunities and evaluating them. So our background in kind of building this particular brand was that you know, we started with a pretty comprehensive data mine. We analyzed like every single sales transaction on like the Etsy marketplace. And what we found was that most of these markets were really fragmented. And the one that really emerged for us was the category that, that we now sell in. So I think for us, we tend to use data automation and rapid manufacturing just to kind of create products at scale and for low cost. That's a great answer. I want to make sure that I'm covering all the bases here. So tell me a little bit about why you chose this business model. So I know you're working with FBA and you're working with e-commerce. So tell me what led you to choose those paths. Sure. So it just kind of made the most sense for us when we started looking at this data for this particular niche what we found was that there were just numerous like small shops small like mom and pop shops you know very indicative of what you would find on etsy but they were each just selling a very small piece of the market and there wasn't a predominant brand out there to kind of consolidate so we thought you know what's really limiting a person or a company from coming in and not making like 10 SKUs, but making like 5,000 SKUs. So through building a customized product development tool, we're able to kind of consolidate this market within the first six months. So I think the first six months of us coming into this market, we had the largest catalog of products within this category. So the business model kind of came out of this like overarching thesis of how do we do you know, everything at a really efficient way. So with the FBA businesses, what we eventually saw was that like Shopify and Etsy is a great platform, but, you know, as you kind of look at trends and kind of look at where transactions happen, you know, it happens on Amazon. And a few years ago, we decided that, you know, we wanted to start creating a brand on Amazon in addition to off Amazon. And I think it ended up being a really good decision in terms of just having, you know, sustained ranking power. And just once you're there, you know, sales kind of keep coming continuously. So that's what kind of drove our business model. Excellent. How does this primarily make money? Sure. So I would kind of categorize it into two buckets. One is the long tail search. So we have thousands of SKUs that just rank by themselves organically with no advertising spent because of how specific and how niche and how long tail that search is. And then what we started doing over the past year and a half is because we have a brand, we thought about, you know, how do we take advantage of this brand? So we started launching hero products as well, just like more single SKU, large ticket items. And then with the community and with our brand kind of backing us, it was easier to launch with initial sales and just to eventually get to the front page of our specific product. So I would say half comes from long tail search and then half comes from the hero products. 
Great. Why are you selling the business instead of keeping it or growing it? Yeah, so we've had this brand for, you know, four or five years now. You know, I think when me and my partner came into this, you know, having left our our jobs, you know, we never really planned on doing something for this long. So I think it's just time for us to move on and do something else. Yeah. I feel like we definitely talk to a lot of people who feel the same way. You have your business and you're like, wow, you know, I was in that for a long time, but it's time to go. Time to move on to other things. Yeah, it's starting to feel like a real job now. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) We don't want that. (laughs) No, so obviously it's the beauty of the model you're working in that tends to be passive. And when it starts getting like a real job, it's probably when it's time to go. So totally get that. (laughs) So let's address some of the business history here. Is there anything that you learned from this business that you would apply to future sites or businesses? What did you learn from building this that just worked for you? Yeah, I think a lot of it was timing for us. I think if we were to kind of repeat some of the things that gave us success in the past, you know, in this day and age, we probably wouldn't see the same kind of results. But I think in general, just tenants that we kind of live by and, and we still see results in is just having a very data-driven mentality. I think for us, the earlier we validate products, the better it is before we start to invest a large amount of money into. I think that's something that we've just built into this business, particularly, is the ability to create a product in under $2, launch it onto, you know, a marketplace like Amazon, and then you can just see immediately whether or not it sells, rather than going through the entire, you know, manufacturing supply chain of going to China, which is what, you know, most FBA businesses do, and then already investing tens of thousands of dollars. I think the other thing that we'll kind of take away and learn from this business is just the importance of having an engaged community, especially launching products. You know, I think for us, just having a brand and having very vocal people in our community who can tell us, you know, what is missing from their current product offerings, what we can do better. That's also just been really helpful because we don't really have to go out and find these answers, you know, in random places. We can kind of just look in front of our door. Yeah, you guys have a pretty special setup when it comes to having that engaged community, like you said, and very active social media. That's something I'm going to ask you about probably a question or two later. But before we leave this topic, you're talking about what was really working for you. And I want to make sure we cover the things that you tried that maybe didn't work that might provide pieces of advice for people listening to this interview. Yeah, so I think as as, as most you know, most startups or most business owners would probably agree with is, you know, for every one success, we probably had, you know, two or three failures. I can't think of, you know, really large failures that's, that's defined, you know, my experience with this brand or with this business, but it's just more of just, you know, overcoming smaller things. I think the tendency with this particular business, because it's so easy to launch products, is that you'll probably experience you know, a good percentage of products that just don't sell or don't work. Not to say that it's a negative ROI, because as long as you sell one unit of one product, it's a positive ROI, just given the unit economics of this. But I think over time, we tend to see, you know, that like long tail curve. So like 20% of the products that we launch end up doing like really well. And then 80% probably just sells between, you know, like two to 20 units total over the course of like a year or so. But again, that's just because of how quick and how easy it is to launch SKUs. So yeah, I would probably say that's uh, just a reality of working with this brand. Yeah, I think that element you're talking about, it's like 20% or, you know, the top earners and 80%, you know, it's they're doing well, you figure out what doesn't work well. It's just such an interesting aspect of your business in particular, the way that you're able to just pivot really quickly and figure out what works. So when you're talking about you're figuring out fast what is really working well for this brand, I think that ties in right to where we're going next. So let's talk about what do you currently do in terms of marketing? So we don't really do too much marketing. I think for us, the majority of the traffic that we've you know seen just comes organically from how specific and how niche our products are. In terms of I guess actual marketing, we run some Amazon ads, we do some, you know, Instagram scheduling, but I think the way that we kind of built this community was just timing. So we came into this niche in a time when it was kind of nascent, when we were one of the few breakaway brands at that time. So getting, you know, engaged customers, getting 
these relationships and then, you know, cultivating relationships with influencers before they became, you know, bigger or more well known. I think all of that was just a product of us being in the right time in the right place. But in terms of actual marketing, you know, we don't really do anything to involved or, or sophisticated. I think that's actually an opportunity for someone, for a potential buyer who would come in. Um, you know, there's a lot of like unturned stones in that area. Where does the majority of your traffic come from? So the majority of our traffic comes from uh, Amazon, just ranking for our products and just natural SEO. So we rank organically for almost every product that we sell. So it's like hundreds or thousands of search terms. Um, and, and that's generally without any ad spend just because of how long tail and niche our products are. Great. Can you describe the process of getting the inventory to Amazon? Sure. So I would kind of categorize that into two buckets again. So we do most of our manufacturing as rapid manufacturing. So we do a lot of 3D printing and we have a U.S.-based 3D printing partner. The general lead time with them is about two weeks out. So we'll place an order. They send the products labeled to Amazon. Everything's taken care of. So it's really just a much more condensed lead time and less investment into holding inventory than, I guess, traditional route of coming from China. The other piece of the business, however, as we kind of scale products that work, those we follow a more traditional manufacturing approach where we have a factory relationship in China. You know, we go through that, you know, one to two month lead time getting our products restocked onto Amazon shelves. Great. And if you were to keep the business, what are some ways you would try to grow it? Sure. Um, it's something that we've already started doing. I've mentioned kind of continuously throughout this is just taking advantage of the brand more and creating a brand in this niche on Amazon and launching new hero products. I think that's been our focus for uh, the past year or so. We've seen pretty good results. The other really large pocket of opportunity here is switching to an FBM model, which we had before. So we were running like our own like 3D printing factory in the U.S. And it was something that like we just had to kind of transition out of because it was such a nightmare. But with our new partner who does all the 3D printing for us, it's been a lot, a lot, lot better. But our brand is actually coupled within one Amazon seller account that has other brands. So we're unable to go back to an FBM model, but I would probably say just having an FBM side to the business probably will give you like an easy like 50K plus of sales in there. And I think the third opportunity for growth, it's something that we, we started already, we just never really executed on, is going into adjacent product lines. So we have about 2,000 plus files. Each file is a SKU for an adjacent product category that like really well to what we're currently selling. And those are you know pretty much like go-to-market ready, which is something that we haven't launched yet. Great. On the flip side, I want to make sure that we're always covering risks. So what do you think are the biggest risks with the business that a buyer should be aware of? So for us, we've been seeing a lot of smaller sellers come in to marketplaces like Etsy, not really Amazon. With this product category on Shopify and Etsy, there's been a lot of saturation in the past like year and a half to two years, just small single person Etsy shops emerging. But Kind of the reason we've been able to become successful in the long run is just kind of bridging or not bridging, but more just like transcending the small seller mentality and being able to create more scalable brand on Amazon. But I think looking into, you know, these smaller marketplaces, it's becoming more and more noisy. So that's just something that I think we just have to move away from. Can you describe the amount and type of work you do on the business for maintenance? Sure. So it's pretty low maintenance at this point. I would say maybe like five hours a week that I'll spend on it. It's mainly just check-ins with the team. There's a daily like status check-ins anyway. But if something needs to be escalated, I just it's just handling those one-off items. The other piece that requires some involvement is approving inventory replenishes. So every time we restock inventory, just you know, glancing that over and making sure that the right things are, are being sent just as a QA. And I think the third category of time is just doing doing social media posts. That's not something that really needs to stay with the owner. It's easily outsourced, but it's something that you know we're currently doing right now ourselves. 
for some reason. <laughs> yeah, because you guys have a pretty big team supporting your business, right? It's like a handful of people. Okay, yeah. And it's, it's a handful of people, at least if I'm remembering the details correctly, that would be willing to continue on with the buyer to help continuing to support the business? Yep, definitely. So our team is all remote. And, you know, they've been with us for quite a long time and they're really familiar with their processes and most of the processes of the business are automated already. So the few pieces that require like a human to do something, you know, they're already really familiar with it. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I just want to make sure that was clear. I think that's a really unique aspect of the business. So what skills or requirements are there for someone not familiar with the niche or business model? Probably say the, the suite of homegrown tools that we have built to create products. That's something that just requires someone to learn just to understand. So they're able to take advantage of the unit economics and just, you know, blast out as many products as they want. I think the other thing that would be good is just being familiar with this niche and with the space. It's not at all a complex niche. <laughs> it, it's actually probably the opposite. But you know, it's a pretty like whimsical, like fun little space to be in. But just being able to understand that category would be nice. Absolutely. How much support are you offering buyers? As much as they need. So we don't have like a cutoff of hours or anything as long as as much time as they need until they get comfortable with the business. Great. And would you commit to a non-compete? Yeah, definitely. We don't foresee coming back into the space. Are you open to negotiating something like an earnout? At this time, no. But having said that, you know, I think just the there's exceptions to every answer. So if the deal is right, then it's something that we would consider. Absolutely. So putting yourself in the shoes of a buyer, why do you think this is a business worth buying? I think it's just a really interesting business. I mean, in really interesting space and a very different perspective of doing e-commerce and selling online. I think it really just takes like the notion of traditional e-commerce and it kind of tilts it on its head. I think not many businesses are able to scale and launch products like within literal minutes, you know, from idea to on marketplace for $2 each new product. I think in that sense, this business offers a lot of flexibility with how you want to grow with what you're interested in with, you know, what your personality for growing businesses, you know, is whether you want to grow through just creating thousands thousands of new SKUs through long tail search, whether you want to expand into adjacent product lines, whether you want to focus on creating a brand and growing a brand through hero products, these are all options and they're all viable. So I think it offers a lot of flexibility. It's a really interesting business model and it's a really fun space to be in. Fantastic. Yeah, it's pretty exciting what you guys are doing. Before I close up, is there anything else that you would like to cover about the business? Anything I might have missed? Nope, I think that's it. Okay. Well, how it's been great talking to you today. Again, it's very exciting, this business that you have. But I'm just really looking forward to seeing what happens and how things play out for you guys. So thanks for coming on and talking to me today. Great. Thanks for having us, Sarah. Yeah, absolutely. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to our channel. And if you want more information, the link will be below the video that'll take you to this marketplace listing. If you're watching this on the listing page and want more information, become a depositor today. When you make the deposit, one of our business analysts will be in contact with you and you'll be given everything you need to review this business. Have a great day.